Hey, everybody. Today is Monday, January 24th, 2022. Coming up on the show today, from the film Tick, Tick, Boom, editor Andrew Weisblum. You know, many first-time directors don't know how to make a decision. That's the biggest struggle you have. They don't understand that that's effectively the gig. And editor Myron Kirstein. You know, of course, the producers always ask you, do you want to keep the crew? I'm like, absolutely. I'll be lost about this crew. Yes, all that and a whole lot more on this episode of The Rough Cut. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Why does he always tell me the date at the beginning? It's not like I don't have a phone or a computer. I know. I can't give you a reason. Some habits are hard to break after doing them for so long, I guess. How long? Well, long enough to have already interviewed today's special guest at least once before. Yes, today we have gathered to talk about a little movie called Tick, Tick, Boom. And we'll have more on that topic in a minute. But as I mentioned, we have had the good fortune to speak to both of these gentlemen on separate and previous occasions, but both in 2021. In reverse order, we spoke with editor Andy Weissbloom last November. Hey, look at that. There's one reason to say the date at the beginning of the podcast. I know we spoke with Andy in November. Monday, November 1st, 2021. See, I guess there's a method to my madness after all. Anyway, we spoke with Andy Weissbloom about his work on Wes Anderson's film, The French Dispatch. Speaking for myself, and who else can you really speak for, I learned a lot in that talk with Andy. There is just so much detail and craft to get play in what Andy does, especially the intraframe editing components and all his work with Wes Anderson. So really good info and something I encourage you to listen to, and of course I do. And in July, July 1st, 2021, we spoke with editor Myron Kirstein about his incredible work on the film In the Heights. That movie is a cinematic adaptation of Lin-Manuel Miranda's musical of the same name, and that particular film was directed by John Chu with Miranda serving as producer and co-creator. This time out with Tick, Tick, Boom, Miranda is also directing the project, which would make him a first-time director. Amazing considering all the things he's already accomplished and all the different talents he possesses. So let's talk a little about Tick, Tick, Boom. The film is currently available on Netflix and is Miranda's homage to Jonathan Larson. Now, if you were at an age in the early to mid-90s where you were cognizant of what was going on in the cultural zeitgeist, you no doubt were aware of Jonathan Larson. And if you didn't know him by name, you were probably aware of the Broadway phenomenon he created known as Rent. Jonathan's life was tragically cut short before he could ever realize the impact his creative genius would have, which makes this film Tick, Tick, Boom all that more meaningful. Tick, Tick, Boom was actually based on a semi-autobiographical musical that Larson created previous to his breakout musical Rent. Both the musical and the film chronicle the conflict an aspiring composer and playwright is feeling about his chosen career path, as well as the fear that time is running out on his dream. Although both Andy and Myron worked on Tick, Tick, Boom, they did not work in parallel, as is often the case. Because of the all-too-familiar COVID delays, Andy Weissblum, who started Tick, Tick, Boom, ran out of time because of a prior commitment to another project. And that's when Lin-Manuel Miranda turned to his In the Heights editor, Myron Kirstein, to pick up the baton and lend his own storytelling instincts and expertise to the film. I think you're going to enjoy this episode quite a bit. I also think you'd enjoy the film quite a bit. Andy and Myron are two really gifted artists in their own right. And I think no matter where you are in your own career path, you're going to get something out of this. Something that you can bring with you on your own journey. As always, it's important to thank the people who helped to make this interview happen and provide you with this great info. And the way to thank them is to give them just a little over a minute or so of your time so they can tell you all about what they have to offer you as a filmmaker. Well, I guess I'll be the one telling you. That's kind of how it works. And the first thing I'm going to tell you is about our friends, yours and mine, at Extreme Music. Back in 1997, not long after Rent took Broadway by storm, Extreme Music began their mission of providing storytellers with the best in production audio. Songs from incredible musicians and composers. Too many brilliant artists to name here, but you can see for yourself over at ExtremeMusic.com. Once you are there, you'll be greeted by a seemingly endless catalog of tracks to set any kind of scene and to suit any kind of story you need to tell. These tracks come in many different links and can be customized right down to the instrumentation so that you get just what you need. All that licensing stuff can be taken care of right there online, or if you want someone to talk to, hey, sometimes we all need someone to talk to, you can connect with one of their reps all over the world to help you with the process. These folks are the best in the business and the only name you need to know when it comes to finding music for your next movie or TV show. So make sure to check out ExtremeMusic.com for all your production audio needs. Okay, so you got your great music. Now how are you going to share it? Not to mention all your other media. How are you going to share it in a method that's fast, affordable, and with the utmost in security? Well, the answer to that is Massive. Spelled M-A-S-V, Massive is a cloud-based file transfer solution that solves your most challenging media management needs. Their pay-as-you-go model means you only pay for what you need, and unlike other media sharing providers, there are no limits to the size of the file you can share. So go ahead and send those uncompressed videos to your teammates all around the world and speed up your production cycle. And since Massive is a member of the Trusted Provider Network, you know your precious media is safe from any kind of harm. 
And one more thing, Massive integrates with most major cloud storage solutions, including popular media providers like Frame.io, Iconic, and Backblaze, so you can save time by automatically sending the files you receive to your cloud storage without having to download and re-upload packages. Finally, if you sign up today at massive.io slash the dash rough dash cut, you can get 100 gigabytes free towards your transfer. I will put a link in the show notes to make it easy for you, but once again, that's massive.io slash the dash rough dash cut for 100 gigabytes free. Okay, time for that curtain to come up on today's show. Here to talk about Lin-Manuel Miranda's Tick, Tick, Boom are editors Andrew Weisblum and Myron Kirstein. Are you singing those songs in the shower yet? Or what? You must go to bed <laughs> with those songs just going over and over in your head. All the time. You're just constantly running them in your head. <laughs> Best way to talk about this project, I think, really, Andy, is to start with you. You were the editor that started the project. So tell me about the circumstances that led to you getting the job, the things you talked about with Lynn, and then the circumstances that led to you handing over the reins to Myron. Yeah, um, Lynn uh, connected with me in late 2019 as he was gearing up for the project, which was all going to take place in New York, where I live and work. And we got together and had a long chat reminiscing about New York in the early 90s and our shared experiences of the theater world at that time and the city at that time and what it was like then, what it's like now, and how to convey what was different. So we bonded over that, and then um, it was off to the races. The shoot was originally uh, late January or early February of 2020, and we know what happened then. So there was a bit of a shutdown for a while. Um, It wasn't until fall of 2020 that we picked up again and we got into the cut. Because a year went by, effectively, my availability started to get squeezed because I had other projects that were coming up for me that I had already known about. So we had to find the appropriate handoff point, um, which was basically at the the director's cut. And that's when uh, Myron entered the story. Before we move on to Myron's participation and how he picked up the reins, had you ever worked, Andy, with Lynn before? And also, have you ever done any kind of musical before? I had not worked with Lynn before, but I had done some other musical stuff. Uh, I I cut the pilot for Smash and worked on musical numbers. I mean, they're not singing musical numbers, but a lot of musical pieces in different films like, well, I suppose you could say Black Swan as an example. But I also worked as the assistant and visual effects editor on Chicago and had to cut a few things in that and TV versions and stuff. So I had an opportunity to work with Rob Marshall on that which was a huge opportunity for me at the time. So that was my background in terms of that. Okay, so not entirely unfamiliar with the genre, but probably not to this extent. No, but but very familiar with who Jonathan Larson was and what that community was on the Lower East Side and, and downtown scene and that theater world, that generation, which was effectively mine as well, that I was able to bring that to bear on this, I think. So Myron, I have a pretty good idea of where you were at with Lynn when the notion of you picking up the project came about, uh, seeing as how we already talked back during In the Heights. But for the sake of posterity, if you would just give us an account of how Lynn approached you with the project. Well, funny enough, he actually approached me through John Chu. John called me first and said, I think Lynn's going to call you. And I said, about what? And he's like, well, his film, I think Andy needs to leave and he wants to see if you're interested. And I only had maybe a dozen interactions with Lynn over the course of making in the heist. So it, getting the call, you know, from John and then eventually talking to Lynn was definitely a pinch me moment of like, is this actually happening? I can't believe I'm going to work on Lynn's first movie. That's crazy. And then he sort of pitched me the movie, which he didn't have to do at all. <laughs> um, and then I ended up uh, moving to New York and living. Well, the edit room was basically at his place and I lived nearby and then tried to do the best I could to get it to the finish line. Well, Andy, you used the term handoff. What is the process or what was the process for the handoff as it were? Is there a discussion that goes on between the two of you or the two of you and Lynn? How do you effectively pass on a project to another editor? Well, you try and give them as much information and support as possible, right? (laughs) I mean, Myron, we we had a few conversations where without trying to muddy the waters too much. I discussed with Myron the things that Lynn and I were in the process of exploring in the film and changes we wanted to affect and what, you know, what we were still working on, what what paths we were on, what avenues we were going through to try and improve the film and make it really land. 
And then, of course, it's a great moment for some fresh eyes, too, because Myron could bring his own ideas and impressions to the thing, not just what I articulated that we were working on, but also what he saw outside of the process, that there's, there's kind of a hybrid that happens there. But then after that, it was my intention, because I knew I was going to get occupied with my next project, that Myron was not just to continue my work, but to really take over the process and collaborate directly with Lynn and be front and center on the whole thing. Because the film, I think, doesn't grow and would otherwise suffer. It was just kind of an execution plan. There was a lot more to be done, as we found out. And, you know, Mime was able to build on our ideas and bring his own to the table that probably never would have occurred to me. So I think the film only benefited from that. Myron, were you able to watch the film with Andy? And, and he mentioned that there were things that he and Lynn were working on that needed greater exploration and needed you to come in and really just sort of figure out where they could go and if they worked. And what were those things that you talked about with Andy about, okay, these are some, I don't want to call them trouble spots because maybe they weren't trouble spots, but things that, that were up for consideration. Well, I never had a chance to actually sit in the same room with Andy at all. Um, well, this is a great day that Andy meet Myron, Myron meet Andy. <laughs> no, we, we met in person at the at the New York premiere. Oh, thank God. That was the first time we were actually in a room together. <laughs> it's crazy, but true. But, you know, I watched the film alone at home in, in California and then immediately got on the phone with Lynn and then got on the phone with Andy and just started the process of learning everything, you know, just downloading both of them, you know, for everything they had talked about and ideas that were still in flux and then had my own concerns and questions and inspirations. And, um, you know, I think that, I think maybe there was, there was a lot of ideas still being explored, like Andy was saying, like in why, for example, there were some concerns about how to make that work emotionally, as well as Sunday, that was still, you know, had some work to be done. But then, as Andy mentioned, there was a bunch of things that just came up over the course of screening the film, which you start to do after director's cut. Actually, it took a while after director's cut because we we're still in the middle, you know, there wasn't vaccines yet. But once we did have the chance to do that, then people start to say, well, I don't understand this, or this character rubs me the wrong way, or, and so you start to react to that. You know, I think that a lot of the things that Myron ended up digging into, I think, were not unpleasant surprises. Like a lot of the stuff we had talked around and discussed, and without really knowing, without the benefit of the an audience reaction, well... Are they going to react to the neurosis of this character this way or that way? How much context will they need for who Larson was and what this musical theater world was in the 90s outside of what's already embedded in the film? Those are the questions that Lynn and I knew, but then it was confirmed when we started to show it to people, the things we had to dig into. And we already had our ideas for it, and it was like uh, you know half-baked potato, I guess. But before we knew it had to be embraced which is what Myra did. Well, we're certainly going to talk a lot about the creative decisions that went into the work that you did. But before we leave the concept of the handoff entirely, I would like to talk about the logistical part of it. And that was it literally done on the same Avid so that the project and media didn't go anywhere? And either way, Andy, is there anything that you do to package up the project and prep it for Myron? Well, I was living up in Lynn's house and then Myron was living in Lynn's house. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was the physical handoff, right? There was one little interim where, um, because there wasn't vaccines yet, and New York actually at the time still had a quarantine for anybody who came into the city. So I was actually put up into a hotel, and they brought an avid there for four days. And I was stuck is the wrong word, but I was, you know, I was living, you know, I had I was living with a project sitting there. I was like, well, I have nothing better to do than. And I'm this is what I'm here to do, but to learn this project. And so we had a little mini system set up where I was just watching all the different cuts, you know, watching the assembly, watching early versions, watching alternate takes, scenes that had been cut out, and, you know, and just trying to learn the project as best as I could. I'd say the other part of this was the consistency of crew. I think almost everybody stayed on when that change happened, which I think was really critical. So that, you know, there were fewer mysteries that way. I mean, it's much harder when you take over a project and everybody's jumped ship, <laughs> which I've seen once or twice. And by the way, they, they you know, that's a testament to Andy and the film is that I think everyone wanted to be there. And 
you know, of course the producers always ask you, you know, do you want to keep the crew? I'm like, absolutely. I'll be lost without this crew. And uh, Cat Spice and David Smith and Nancy Allen, they were all really great to show me where everything was, you know, as far as VFX, as far as, you know, alternate cuts, as far as like, how did we get there, you know, from the music editing perspective? Um, you know, you just, you're cramming like an exam before you start to work with the master. <laughs> and, you know, because he's going to ask you a question and he's not going to always know where the answer is because Andy did the work, you know? So I had to, you know, just really, you know, get under the hood. So when you take over Andy's project, before you load up your settings on the project, I'm just trying to envision a world where you actually open up Andy's project. It's almost like, you know, moving to somebody's house, like an Airbnb, like you're walking into someone else's <laughs> world and look around going, oh, so this is where Andy keeps the couch. So did you have a chance to actually study the way that Andy sets up his timeline and configures his media composer and all that stuff? Yeah, which was very similar, thankfully enough, um, just as far as like where you keep scenes and how you do cuts, you know, his timeline was crazy because he's, you know, he's just, he's got slux stacked, you know, different versions of shots. Um, I'm very like, I gotta, I don't try to, I'm very like anal clean, not that Andy isn't, but I just, I just have a tendency if I have too much stuff on the timeline, I get, you know, my ADHD kicks in and I just can't focus on the actual image that I'm supposed to be cutting. Whereas I think Andy's always done this thing with his timelines, or at least what I saw, which was kind of almost like very painterly in that, um, you know, uh, what things are up there and what, what are options that he can pull down if he wants it. And does that make sense, Andy? Does it? Yeah, I end up, I like to leave a lot of stacked alternates in my timeline for things. Like if I know I can get someone around a room with a blocking issue, yeah, I'll leave the alternate underneath whatever's on top. I mean, I think the other difference that we have is um, I probably work with a lot more tracks in terms of audio and other things. But then on the flip side, I'm cutting in stereo. I never cut anything but stereo because I'm always kind of paranoid that it's not going to translate when I send someone a cut and they're wearing, they're wearing headphones and I'm in a room with, you know, six speakers. And all my settings and all my layouts were actually laid out for uh, in the Heights, which was all 5.1. So I had to do a lot of configuring just to kind of make sure it all, you know, even when you're just kind of like trying to you know, rubber band or something, you know, mix it in the timeline or whatever, like you're set up in a certain way. So I had to, you know, kind of conform to his. And by the way, they asked me, do you want to go to five one? I was like, I think this is going to be such a mess if I convert this in the middle of a show. Yeah. I, and I get the benefits of it. It's just for me, um, I've kind of been beaten into a philosophy that if it, if it can't work with two tracks, it's not going to work with six. So, you know, you, I always kind of, it forces me to prioritize what I'm listening to when and where if I keep it, you know, stripped down. And then that ends up, those priorities ended up getting carried through later, ultimately, I find. Over the course of doing all these interviews, I find that no issue divides Editorial Nation more than the stereo versus 5.1. So you are not unusual in that regard. Oh, and I love 5.1. And I like, you know, I've worked on movies where you embrace the immersive experience completely. But to me... I say that aspect of it for the mix itself and not for the not for the process before because it's kind of like a temple of hybrid for me instead of what you're actually doing in the spatializing in a in a mix that is much more sophisticated than anything I could pull off. You know, I on in the heights it was so much fun to go down the rabbit hole with five one, but there is an aspect to it that is a bit distracting that, you know, if you're focusing on sound too much and not putting all your efforts into just cutting picture, you know, it's, we are picture editors. So just, try, you know, it's, it's so much fun actually mixing five one. I really dig it, but there is something nice to just like, this is my job. I have to focus on telling the best story with these, these images and with something with like tick, tick, boom, which is so nonlinear. There's so many moving pieces. That it's almost, it was almost better just to like not have that option, you know, and that distraction. And again, it's something else to like, just keep me from doing what, you know, I need to do. I'm also one of those dudes who like, if I, if the cut's not working, I can't figure out what's going on. I'll turn the sound off and just work on it until visually I can hear it, if that makes sense. And, it, and it's, it's flowing in a way that makes sense because then if I know at the base level that that's working, then I've eliminated that as the problem. And then I figure out what it is about the sound that's disassociating or whatever else it is. I, I love that so much. And even when you're talking about a musical, because I'll say that all the time, 
especially to young editors, like, you know, turn the sound off and see if you're telling the story visually. And, you know, that you just have to, and, and it's another way to refresh your brain and keep things, you know, really focused on very specific things versus getting distracted or covering up something with sound, you know, cheating to some degree. Yeah. Well, I know you guys have done a lot of interviews for this film and probably been asked this next question a hundred times. So I apologize that I'm going to ask it as well, but I just, I want to know myself what it was like cutting at Lynn's house and what influenced that decision. It was COVID influenced as a decision. I mean, I think we had plans to have a cutting room in the city and everything, but when we cut bait on that, it just seemed like the logical thing that we were basically potting together the two of us with his family. And then, you know, it was just like a tight circle that, that presented less risk all around. And that was the motivator for it. So he was very gracious, as was his family, that, you know, let us set up shop there. And I had my own space. <laughs> so it wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't too much of a nuisance, I hope. But Lynn is the busiest man in America, probably, or up there. And while we were working, you know, he'd go off we talk about something and then he'd go off and every week there was some new song that was due for some new project or some new deadline that was looming. And somehow, I don't know how he divides his brain up that way, but he would be able to do that and then come back in the room and be fully focused on whatever we were working on, which was pretty unique. I would say it's, I think I described it as like, you know, Andy Warhol's factory was going on downstairs and, you know, but, you know, there's, it's very inspiring to be around then to have, you know, he's working, he was working on songs for Encanto. So you'd literally hear the piano downstairs or he'd like, can I play you? I want song, you know, with his voice. And I, you know, you know, just burst out in tears when I'm like, I'm the first person maybe in America hearing this song, but all that is feeding back into you, into the edit room, you know, you're like, you know, I have, it's raising the, you know, what, what I saw. Hamilton the first time was right when I the first couple of weeks of editing in the Heights I was like oh my god I just have to raise the bar big time and I think that's kind of like what you're what uh, how I experienced being at Lens was just like this is the man I have to I have to meet you know I have to meet um, somewhere creatively and keep stretching and um, but also you know also being very inspired at the same time. He's just such a sweet, caring, thoughtful person. And, um, you know, being around that was really nice as well. You know, one of the things that I think is true in all editing situations is that the edit room and the space is a very sensitive, personal space, no matter what. Because you're working with someone on a project that they care about and they're confronting their their failures in the shoot (laughs) more often than not and trying to be constructive and figure out the best way forward and being heard and and delivering their vision. So working in someone's home is almost kind of like an extension of that. Like we're, we're in such a, we're such a direct personal experience in like, you know, the writer's room together effectively that it's not a huge leap when you're in someone's house working on it. I've happened just by circumstance, I've done it a few times with a few filmmakers just for different reasons logistically. And, um, you know, it's always the same thing. I hope one of those was John Waters. No, it wasn't John Waters. I never, I never worked in his home. Of all the houses, man, that's Uh, the one I'd want to cut in. Well, I've been to his home in in New York, not in Baltimore, unfortunately, but yeah, it's everything you would imagine. Okay. Well, so I'm imagining you guys at Lynn's house in this very personal, sensitive environment, cutting away But you have these assistants there to help you, you know, where were they set up and how did you collaborate with them in this really unique environment? Well, unfortunately, it's all it was all remote this round, which is probably the biggest drag of this whole thing. And, you know, there's nothing I like less than this whole I know people love it for their freedom and then other people hate it. I'm, I'm on I'm on the B side of that, the whole remote work thing. I just I love having a creative space where we can all be together and I can collaborate with the team and. I know that they are feeling involved and engaged and you have FaceTime with people and the collaboration is a social thing. And invariably on every project, the crew and assistants bring ideas if they feel involved. And that's deeply challenged when you're not sitting together every day and you're not looking each other in the face. And and even just playing an assembly of a scene for an assistant and just feeling the energy in the room, whether it's right or wrong. You know, I'm always striving to share with the crew. And also it's very important to me to offer up scenes for assistants to cut 
because I always feel like I have nothing to lose with that. You know, they can only bring good ideas to the table. Plus, you know, if they're good, it just makes it easier for me. And it's just, I want them to be involved in the process, not just shuffling synced footage and data for me. I mean, that's not the gig. My presumption is they're working in films because they, or, or entertainment, TV, whatever it is, because they care about it and like it because there are plenty of easier ways to make a living. So that's, 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 that's something you have to incorporate in the process and make sure that people feel involved. Yeah, I found that coming on as a new guy, not only did I have to like earn trust with this crew, but I also had to be the somewhat of a cheerleader for them as well. So encouraging these Zoom meetings and um, FaceTime and anything just to kind of emulate the feeling of being in the cutting room, just to make sure that we're all part of this team. And as Andy said, maybe you could steal some ideas or something in some conversation can inspire you to try something else. And that, that was definitely a lot with the VFX side and the music editing side, just the, those constant conversations just to be able to um, you know, generate new ideas and solve problems. And instead of the um, other room, you know, you're just doing all that over Zoom. Yeah. I'll say that Kat did a lot of assembling of ex- exploration of ideas for me, with me during the assembly process and also during the first part of the director's cut because there were a lot of like side errands or, or experiments that happened that then kind of informed process later on and gave us new ideas that then ended up in the film. And I just think that that's really critical to what we do. Well, Myron, you said that you were asked, you know, do you want to keep this crew or do you want to bring in your own team? But neither of you, as far as I can see, had worked with the first assistant and assistant previously. So my first question is, how did that come to pass? That seems a little unusual. I was just lucky enough to find Kat and Morgan and Dave I had worked with, a visual effects editor in the past, the rock star. So it was just through the interview process of finding the right, the right fit. And I'll say that there isn't like this huge, you know, deep bench on, you know, musicals out there with assistance. You know, it's not like you can find the right people who have the experience level. So I think it's just trying to find the team that's going to, um, you know, bring it to the finish line, you know, who you have the most confidence to be able to do that. You know, none of my crew, I, most of the crew rather, I hadn't worked with on in the Heights either. I just had the confidence of like, okay, these are the, this is a team I think it's going to be able to do it. And Dave, you know, he's somebody who I've known over 20 years and never had a chance to work with. Um, and uh, I was just so happy to just, you know, get together with him as a VFX editor and, you know, and he, you know, they all, they all, they all brought so much. Um, you, you, we're lucky that we find them, not the other way around. Well, for either of you, as we touched on a little bit, this is Lynn's first feature directing job. And he had a really nice quote about the editorial process with you guys, and I will read it to you. He said that, I found that editing is similar to composing a theater score, playing with tempo, tension, and release, figuring out when to stay in a moment, when to zoom past it, when to return to it. It was the thing I was most scared of, but turned out to be incredibly analogous to what I know how to do. So just your reflections on working with him in the editing room, any revelations he might have had while working with you. And vice versa, anything you picked up from him as a composer um, that you could incorporate into your own work? Well, you know, I think Lynn understood the assignment. Is that the term that people use now? Um, he, he says the old man. I think, um, you know, the thing you want with the director is for them to be direct and decisive about what they want, right? And Lynn certainly knows how to do that and how to weed through the information and the options and make a decision that pushes the thing forward, which, you know, many first-time directors don't know how to make a decision. That's the biggest struggle you have. They don't understand that that's effectively the gig, is making the decisions and doing them in a consistent way with a consistent vision that gets you the best film. Furthermore, I think he recognized right away that editing is rewriting. And that you'd kind of take the ideas that you had before and retool them based on what's working and what isn't to improve on things or fix things. He understood that right away. And, you know, there were there were priorities for him in terms of the storytelling or thematic or ideas that, that he wanted to get across or messages. But ultimately, he was not a precious director in that, the, you know, killing of babies was not a problem. 
he was willing to experiment and understanding that there was no permanence in that and that you can ultimately revert and go back and the worst thing that happens is you find an idea that's better than the original one <laughs> he, and he and he was you know open to that and prepared to do that and looked at every idea no matter how shitty which is really what you want you want to know that they're able to do that and not feel distracted and frustrated yeah, he created a place where you're just allowed to play, which is just ultimately all you want from being an editor or, you know, as or just an artist is just that safe place to just throw out stupid ideas. But then, you know, there's a kernel there that can make something really great or amazing. So just just to be allowed to explore. But, you know, uh, it's intimidating to cut music with Lint, you know, so if you're cutting... <laughs> If he says, you know, you can cut the bridge out to come to your senses and it might still work, you're like, okay, how do I, the department's like, how do I do that? And then, you know, then you do it and then you're like, the music editor is, you know, Nancy's like, yeah, I think it's going to work. And then the composer, Alex Sakamar is like, I'm not sure if musically we can get away with that. And then Lynn's like, no, we can do it. We just need to finesse this and re-record that. So there's a lot of just learning on the fly with somebody who's like in outer space as, as far as I'm concerned, as far as, you know, just trying to catch up, you know, on that side of things and trying to cut something as complex or recut something as complex as therapy, which was already in really good place when Andy had left it off. But then he's like, cut it down further, you know, uh, put this line in between that music. And I'm just like, you know, it just scrambles your brain, you know, quickly. But, you know, he was very patient. He never, it was never like, why are you taking this amount of time to, to do this, you know, which is good because everybody knows how it is with somebody sitting on your back saying, you know, get it done now. And there was never that feeling, you know, with him. It's just, but you know, the stakes are high and you're just like, I don't want to look like an idiot if I cut this wrong. Well, I, I'm sure you were respectful of the fact that Andy was on to another project, but was there ever a moment, you know, we talked about the initial handoff. Was there any time where you two communicated during your part of editorial, Myron, check in with each other about anything, uh, whether it's a creative or technical question, or maybe Andy, you just wanted to see how things were coming along. Any interaction after that initial handoff? We checked in a few times. I mean, you know, I, I was on to my own process on my other monster and Myron was up to his neck, but I was privy to the test screening, you know, the preview screening feedback and some of that other stuff. And and some of the core changes. I think I looked at one cut along the way, but it was mostly just some conversations about what was going on. It wasn't more involved than that, really, right? I, that, that, that I can remember. No, there was some times. I, at first, Andy was like, you need to carve out your own relationship with Lynn. I was like, don't leave me. You know, I was like, <laughs> no, no, don't go. But, uh, you know, he was he was right just to let me sort of drown for a little while and then you know and then catch my breath and then you know it started to generate my own ideas but there was a few times i was like i don't know i I don't know how to solve this and would email or text with andy and get on the phone a few times but he was pretty respectful slash just trying to push me in the deep end and um because i was you know i was in the trenches i had to you know no one was gonna no one was gonna save lynn and us so we had to figure it out there and, um, you know, even when you like screen, you know, for an audience, they always tell you like there's problems, but they never have any answers for anything. They just tell you what they don't like. So you're kind of scratching your head and trying to read between the lines and you're talking to producers and producers, you know, sometimes have ideas and sometimes, you know, they just say, don't change anything. It's perfect. It's just a bunch of random people. And then, you know, the studio is coming at you and saying, you know, very, broad vague things so you're you know you just kind of kind of have to get um your hands dirty and keep at it you have to figure out the consensus and the kind of note behind the note and what is it that you can do to address that thing that won't change the intention but maybe redirect the problem that's always the trick because you can't break the dna of a movie right ultimately that's when the process falls apart is that when you're trying to make something dramatic a comedy or vice versa or you're trying to do something that's not baked into the intention you can always feel that and you can always see through it and then and, and the movie feel ends up feeling disjointed because of it it's always trying to figure out why are we not delivering on the original idea and how can we fix that 
I think that's the thing. And what's distracting from that? What's the what's the core what's the core thing that matters that will get us through the problem that we're aware of? And Andy, you know, delivered a film when I first watched it that I was ugly crying by the end of the film when I was watching, and I was just like, this as Andy said once just got under your skin. And I was like, it sure did. And but then, but I said, but why am I not engaged on this in the first half of the movie? And you know, and so you start to ask those questions to yourself and you know, what can I do? Um, and that was mostly my assignment. It was like how to begin and end of this film and then tweak musical numbers and work on, you know, some character issues. But, you know, there was so much of the film that was really on its feet. Andy really, I think maybe, I don't know, he probably spent, he probably spent more time than any cut he ever delivered to somebody else to make sure that it wasn't a mess because, um, you know, so that, for me, it was just like trying to isolate issues and then, you know, trying to solve them by just experimentation. I mean, I think Myron and I, when we both talked, we were in agreement at kind of the point at which the film kind of clicks into place and into gear. And, and that from that point forward, while there are adjustments to be made and things to get lost, but things to improve, ultimately it's about collapsing and simplifying the first third of the film or, or even the first half to try and make sure that the conflicts and the characters and the story and everything and the context are all laid out in a way that doesn't feel overly pedantic, but also straightforward. Well, let's talk about that first half or first third of the film, specifically the beginning, which is always the hardest part, I think. You know, the nice thing about musicals is you have the lyrics to help set up the context of the story you're about to see and hear. You know, the opening number of the film, 3090, does that to great effect. Uh, you know, 3090 means... The 1990 is going to be 30, yeah. Yeah, right. He's going to be 30 in 1990, which 30 sounds great to me, but uh, he was at a different <laughs> place in his life. <laughs> I'd go back to 30. I mean, you know, I'd like, go back to 30 in a minute. Right. <laughs> did you adhere to the order of the numbers in the original unfinished piece that Larson did, or were you able to move things around to help craft a stronger narrative? No, ultimately, the numbers didn't move around, but we did eliminate one. In terms of the source, you know, there's the original one man show, and then there was a three person show, and then other scraps that were kind of autobiographical or around his world that he worked on around around that time. But it was all just based on the idea of the framework as a performance, as a rock performance. And that was our blueprint. I mean, how the film started changed pretty considerably from where we had started it in the beginning of the process. And I think that just had to do with setting the context and setting the tone and kind of this bookend idea, which was like half developed when Myron came in. And the use of archival, other things like that, and and footage that was meant to feel archival. We wanted to set that up as a vocabulary thing. The other thing that kind of was starting to present itself in the editorial process when Myron came in was, and was also in the script, was kind of this this cross cutting notion between you've got 1992, which is the performance in 1990, and then you have certain backstory beats like the Sondheim episode and the other things that kind of folds time a little bit. Once you have that. As part of your vocabulary, structurally, it, it was only a matter of time we figured out that, you know, that's a device that could be pushed further to collapse time more in the first third or first half of the film. Because if it's already, as I say, part of the DNA, you're not really forcing that mold on top of it. It's already in the equation. So that was something that went forward to great effect that I think we knew would happen in some way, not to the extent that it did though. So Myron, in your work in approaching the opening and then also probably the ending, you know, I jumped ahead a little bit into the 3090 number. Actually, it starts with a voiceover and you see archival footage, but we don't revisit the voiceover. And basically Larson is the narrator or Greek chorus throughout the film. The decision to do the voiceover at the beginning and the end, was that something that was new or you played around with? And also the discovery process for the archival footage. It was all exploration over the course of trying to find um, the right way to set up this movie. Andy had worked with archival footage in the body of the film with another section of the film that um, explained superbia to the audience. It delved deeper into telling the audience what that musical was going to be. And it ended up being simplified for different reasons. But just those images alone inspired me as well as at the end of the film, there's a little bit more archival about what, what was Jonathan's legacy 
during Louder Than Words. And so I just knew that there was an element to the archival that I liked, but I didn't know if I was going to use it anywhere else. And then we kept playing around with this idea of just giving the audience some kind of context, some kind of even playing field. Everyone can know who Jonathan Larson was, who he is. At the beginning of this film, it was like, well, how do we do this? We could do it with archival. We could do it with words on the screen. We could do it with voiceover. So we started to explore all those different, I don't know, textures, you know, uh, you know, variables. Um, I just had a lot of things to play around in the kitchen sink <laughs> and I didn't know what to do with it. And it, it was a matter of just, you know, okay, I'll try this today where, you know, maybe I'll start the film with like the piano slip cover being pulled off of the piano and then we'll see Jonathan standing there or maybe we'll use some beta cam footage at the end of the film. And maybe I'll have the blowing out of the candle at the beginning of the film. I was like, well, maybe there's, <laughs> maybe there's some, reshoot we can do of uh you know that's more uh you know just jonathan and you know susan in love together at the diner so there was just a lot of exploring a lot of discussions between myself lynn and stephen levinson the screenwriter and then just building rebuilding in the edit just to try to find a way to make something really elegant that was also, like Andy said, like wasn't anything different from the rest of the movie. It just was something that would just feel really organic, which isn't always easy because some of these other ideas I was trying was like, Lynn would say, he would see, it was like, that's so cool. It's not our film. <laughs> and that could be really fun and frustrating where you're just like, oh, what is it? And what does the audience need? And what information do they need? And they're lost here. Or I don't like Jonathan Larson. Or I don't know who Jonathan Larson is. Did he, what did he write? Why do I care? And, you know, what image is, <laughs> is going to actually make you fall in love with him is those are all things that are pretty intangible to solve in an edit room, you know, by yourself with your director. But it's just, you just keep playing around until something starts feeling right. Part of that archival footage is at the very end in the credits where you actually get to see the real Jonathan Larson. Was the idea always to hold that off till the end so that people could embrace Andrew Garfield first as Jonathan Larson? Or did you ever give any consideration to maybe we incorporate Jonathan, the real Jonathan, at different points in the film? I think I started maybe thinking about playing around with it maybe a little bit earlier before 3090 had started. But I don't think we ever took it really seriously to like really incorporate it. I think if we do that, we just start to um, undermine the movie. And I think Liam was saying, like, we've made everyone believe in this thing. And I think he referenced the Tina Turner biopic one time. Like, you're so in love with the actress who plays Tina Turner through that film. And then you cut to the actual Tina Turner, you're like, whoa! You know, it's like all the magic sort of goes away. So once you bring in the real person, I think you got to, if you're going to do it at all, is do it at the end. And do it in a way that doesn't feel saccharine, which is always really tough with biopics. And something we talked a lot about with ending the movie is Lynn was like, I don't want this to feel like every biopic you've ever seen, you know, where you have, you know, the words, you know, on the screen, which is something we actually talked about, you know, doing at some point, you know, Jonathan died at this age at this at 12.01 PM on the corner of, so just doing it in an elegant way over credits just felt like something really, you know, special and, 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 and emotional, you know, and, and then you could tell the audience, you know, hey, look, we got this pretty close. You know, this was the details are there. Right. I mean, the truth is, I think the way that that footage plays at this point is kind of honoring him instead of mm. suggesting, look at the stunt that we did. We recreated this guy, you know, because by then the hope is you have come to know Andrew as this person, as this character that's kind of fully formed. Mm. And that really the headline that comes before that is just the, you know, the incredible impact he made on the, the world at the time, you know, at the time, even though he didn't get the chance to be part of it, but it all starts small. Well, you guys talked about this a little bit already, and that's the major construct of the movies bouncing back and forth between his stage presentation that he's giving and then just him living his life. One example would be a number like the song Therapy, which I think you did mention already. When you're breaking up that song or changing it, I, I guess I should say, you know, when you're intercutting between the performance footage and then the dramatic scene that's playing against it, how do you approach a big intercutting thing? Well, it was several phases which is so that you didn't end up getting tied to a specific intercut. The first move was to cut the argument scene as its own self-contained, fully formed dialogue scene. And that just had to work on its own. And then there's the musical number, which has its own select pieces internally. 
which is fairly quick to put together because ultimately you you know how that's going to work and it's you know it's covered in a pretty specific way and then and the musical number has its grid so that that takes a day maybe while you finish the other scene and then it's figuring out the intercut and you know what the core moments are of going away and coming back from the argument for it to have the proper arc when i assembled it at first i knew it was going to be way too long but as with every assembly I want to lay out the whole deck of cards there so that we know everything that we have and we can always revert back to something or get selected. But by doing the work of having the scene as its own self-contained scene, you could then change the intercut relatively efficiently and be more limber about it in terms of the best making the scene work on its own merits. But the real challenge with that number was that the tempo is constantly increasing. So figuring out how to massage those tempo increases with each cutaway to the dialogue so that it doesn't feel like you're continuing at one tempo and then when you cut back to the musical number it's like this and then like this you you don't want to realize you want to feel it ramping up so i worked i did maybe five or six rounds with nancy allen our music editor during during actually assembly while they were shooting going back and forth with her to figure out if I needed, you know, to get from this BPM to that BPM, do I need to pull out three frames or add a second and which would be the best option within the dialogue? So you kind of have this grid you're constantly working on and revising. Well, then comes the challenge of cutting it down, which I did one round of, but then it was Myron's fun to figure out how to cut that down even further once we had already done all that BPM work. Now, of course, in doing that, he also removed a certain section of the song too, which means you're not just leaping from here to here, you're leaping from here to here. And how do you do that in a way that doesn't feel like you've just lopped off a section of the scene? And then, of course, I mean, it's the obvious progression, but the scene becomes less of a self-contained scene and they start to juxtapose against each other more and more evenly until you end up with where it was at. Yeah, it seemed like that, God, it could just unravel so quickly, especially if you're not careful and, you know, just learning as much as you can about that process and then discovering and then you realize, oh, Andy did this or Nancy did that and how am I going to do this? And Len wants me to cut this section out. Like, then you actually have the scene itself, the fight, you know, you don't, you want to make sure that you're not just unraveling the big picture, you know, by just trying to make something work musically. So it just feels like it's a big ball of yarn that could just <laughs> go down the hallway and, you know, you'd never be able to catch up. Um, so you have to be really careful when there's so many moving pieces. The same thing with Come to Your Senses. I was recutting that, that song as well and cutting out big sections and then realized that Andy's like speeding up, you know, shots or re- doing a lot of rewriting of the song in the first place. And and then on top of that, you know, you have all this VFX work going on on a scene like that, you know, so you're like, yeah, I just cut out 20 shots and the VFX producer is like, what, what, did you, what, what are you doing? I was like, I don't, it might be just an experiment. Maybe, maybe it'll be back in tomorrow. Um, or, you know, green, green dress, for example, you know, the whole number was cut out and that was all green screen but when it came to therapy it looks sort of easy but andy did so much exploration and so much work being able to intercut those two different things one of the things we should touch on here which myron just brought up a little bit is the whole visual effects strategy in this movie there are a lot more visual effects in this movie than you might realize when you're looking at it i use a lot of tricks in terms of splitting and comping and Stuff from the Wes Anderson days? Yeah, yeah, funny of that. Fortunately, it's become part of my DNA. But the thing that I knew was important right away is because the shoot methodology was so constricted by COVID and all the precautions and location stuff and green screens and, you know, actors who weren't together that had to be comped together and stuff like that. It was really important to me that when Netflix or anyone saw the film that it felt as polished as it could and let that stuff not be a distraction. So before anybody could really grasp what was happening, I was getting temps and post-vis into the works on everything that we could so that by the time people were watching the movie and hopefully liked it, they had bought the car, if you will. (laughs) And and then those things become less of of a, a haggle. 
if this if something ain't broke, you know. I mean, that's at least my approach to it in that situation because I've definitely been in situations where you rely on the imagination of people who are watching the films, whose job it is is to justify their existence by giving a note or interceding into it. And then you take the guesswork out of that when you visualize it for them in some form. But I think that's just a really important thing to do in that process. I think I've learned a lot from Andy from that because I've always been the the careful person saying, I don't want to waste anybody's money, you know, but um, the fact that he was able to like put so many things in motion before I was even there, you know, allowed me to actually get even more. Uh, not only did I get all the effects that he put in the motion, but I could also add maybe 300 shots of atmosphere put in, mm-hmm. you know, into the film, which is very costly and, but would have made all that stage, all the stage work would have looked so much. Now, this wasn't Alice Brooks, the, the cinematographer always planned an atmosphere, but you know, nobody ever put a number to it. And so if Andy hadn't set all that stuff in the motion, I probably would have, it would have been even a harder battle for me to fight. Totally different argument. Exactly. Yeah. You know, literally, I don't think I would have gotten those shots and probably half of the shots that he had already put into motion. And as you work on bigger VFX shows, just shows that you kind of have to keep all the balls in the air, really, you know, and some things they'll ask you, you know, let us know, do you really want to buy this shot? Because it's going to be expensive. But, you know, for a lot of things, you just, you know, with music editing, a musical, you have to be working with your music editors almost like the entire time of the process. You can't just show up a month before your final and say, okay, let's start working on the music. You know, it's a process that starts from day one of shooting till the the final mix. And the, I would say it's the same with VFX now. Yeah. All those ideas have to get their day in court and you can't just say, we're going to do X. And then somebody, once, once things start to go over budget, they start to question it without having ever seen it. Uh, some of the most effective visual effects Um, movies that I've worked on were on the chopping block for that reason. And I just learned to prioritize getting those things in motion before someone else has something to say about it. Well, Andy, hearing you talk about converting beats per minute to number of frames to cut gave me brain freeze. (laughs) But is that a a case where even though he's a first time director working with somebody of Lynn's unique talents where he could actually help when it comes down to cutting up a song or manipulating a song or changing the instrumentation of the song, the stems, things like that? Yeah, I mean, he he certainly, I didn't have to explain it to him. Let's put it that way. <laughs> if I said, can we cut from here to here? Or can I combine this verse with that verse to cut out this chorus, which we did, and a cut that we did in swimming, which was a little strange musically. He understood what I was trying to do and why and was able to, like, he knew what I needed to get a grace note to get through it in one part, particularly in swimming. And what the tempo change was when we did a cut like that and come to your senses and some other things. So, you know, you can talk that language with him or ask him, is this good? Is this right? Will this work? And, you know, have some confidence that he'll have the correct answer to that question. So, Myron, did you notice anything? You know, I know that I think you said that, um, you know, Lynn, you, you interact with him maybe, I think you said 10 times during In the Heights. But just in seeing the footage and, and just seeing what his shooting style was in terms of coverage, in terms of the takes, things like that. Anything that seemed familiar to you that he might have learned from John Chu or his experience on In the Heights with you? Well, you know, Alice Brooks was the DP of both of those films. So I think him having Alice more than anything, I think that probably he just learned that editing was, you know, writing, rewriting. You know, there was tons of times where we would cut out a musical number in In the Heights and present it to Lynn and he'd be like, what are you doing? <laughs> and and I think that um, him seeing that editing the movie is a process. It's it's about process. And I think that, you know, that probably gave him a little bit more knowledge to something he already instinctually knew. When we uh, did our preview and started screening the film, he's like, yeah, that's like previews for Broadway, where you just, you know, you screen for an audience or you show your your show in front of the audience and then you tinker from there. And so I think he just probably saw more of that by doing his own film. And then, uh, you know, he got a little bit of a taste of that over the course of, you know, in the Heights. And they're very different films because uh, the focus is so much smaller in the Heights is just so the canvas is just so big and there's so many different characters, so many different storylines 
Whereas, you know, Lynn really was able to focus on primarily Jonathan, Michael, and Susan. And um, I think he likes making smaller, very, I don't know, experimental films, I would say. But um, he likes to please a crowd, I think. I think that's pretty important. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if we're, if we're teaching Lynn anything. I think it's the other way around. But he said something that was fascinating to me at one point. He just kind of slipped this out. And I thought it was a very um, self-observant that's a word thing to say, which is at least at this point, he doesn't ever want to be the writer, the producer and the director. And that he always wants one point of that triangle to be somebody else. So that, you know, there's a degree to which he can remove himself and be less precious about whatever it is that's going on. So like in this case, he's not the screenwriter. That was eye opening to me that he, he, he knew that, he needed that degree of separation in his process, which I think is, I think is true of everything he's done. If anything, you know, his leadership, you know, I think maybe he learned that from John to some degree um, by just watching how he carried himself on the set, but he already has all that. And I think, but he's also like, to Andy's point, this collaborator who just like brings out the best of each person. I think that when you see that with a somebody like Lynn, you know, you just want to, you know, bring your best to it. And, um, and I think that, you know, he probably saw how John carried himself on the set and that how people look to him to make certain decisions, but then to collaborate with, you know, his editors or his DP or his actors, everyone just wants to bring everything that they've got, you know, to, to somebody like that. You know, you both know that sometimes an editor comes in to pick up a project because of a scheduling conflict, like what you had here. But more often, it's the case that things just aren't working out with the first editor for whatever reason. You know, when a film's not working, it'd be pretty easy to blame the editor. But when that situation arises, for whatever reason, comes the conundrum of what to do with the crew, as we've talked about at the beginning. Sometimes the incoming editor will keep the crew that's there, as you did, Myron. Other times, out of loyalty to their own crew, they'll bring in their people. What is your philosophy about whether or not the incoming editor should displace the I guess, incumbent editing crew with their own team, or should they at least try and make it work with that team first before they bring in their normal crew? Well, I think unless it's a really sour situation, continuity of crew is always kind of better than not in terms of understanding where to pick up from and what the history is of things. So you're not kind of retreading old territory or whatever else. I think that's generally the case. And usually that works out. I mean, I've been in other situations where the, a new editor takes over, and I've been in situations where it's multiple editors, like a revolving door kind of coming in and out, whether it's addressing different agendas or different ideas or the workload becomes different or there are other creative explorations that people want to take that you don't want to sidetrack from the main process. I mean, you know, I've worked on those projects too. And then you expand and contract that crew accordingly. But I think it's pretty critical that there's some consistency in the middle there. Yeah, I would agree. I It only helps me to be able to download the crew and have them help me. That said, you know, my first conversation always with the crew is like, do you want to be here? Do you love working on this film? Would you love working for me? You came onto this film for this editor. How are we going to work together? And I'm pretty candid from the get-go about that. But, you know, these are jobs or the people are dependent on these jobs to make a living, to pay their mortgages. And I'm not there to like kick them off for just out of my ego or even to the loyalty of my own crew. You know, sometimes I might call my crew and say, I don't know about this new crew, <laughs> stand by. But, you know, these are jobs. This is how people make a living. So why do that if you don't have to? When I was going back through, you know, and it wasn't that long ago, although it feels like forever that I interviewed each of you separately for the last films. You know, I looked at my notes about the work that you've each done. And I remember speaking with Myron about the film Fame. So I knew that he had that in his bag of tricks. But I'd forgotten about 3D Glee, the concert movie, which was in Mr. Christine's <laughs> IMDb page. And it, it got me thinking about what's going on right now in theaters and the future of the theatrical experience. I mean, there was a while that 3D was going to be the big differentiator about why people would go out to the theaters. And then 3D just sort of without anybody really commenting on it, just sort of faded away. At least it felt like, like it wasn't a big thing. I would just love to have both of you pontificate about like, what do you see as the future of, and I know this is a hard one, but the future of the theatrical experience. Is it going to have to be big 3D action type things? Or do you see things coming back around where I can go see a French dispatch or, or a In the Heights or Tick, Tick, Boom in the theater? Well, I mean, there may be a resurgence after if this pandemic thing ever stops, right? Where people just want to get out of the damn house. But 
beyond that, I don't really know what the future is for smaller films theatrically, because at least for me, the convenience and viewing experience of watching at home is no different than most smaller theaters and a lot more pleasant <laughs> to watch on your on your 60 to 70 inch tv screen with your sound system and your streaming it's like it's you know on your own time but that's <laughs> that for a lot of viewing experiences that's become a norm i think i don't know that that's bad it's just different but i think i hope i mean the theatrical experience is what i fell in love with and why i do what i do is that there's still room for that kind of film you know, larger films that are not necessarily regurgitation of the same kind of IP and new packages with new casts, I think is important for the creative growth of the art form, which is what I think it is. I'm pretty bored by that stuff. I know people love it, it's, but it's, you know, I hope it's more than a roller coaster ride for people. You know, I hope it's an immersive experience for people and people get that. I mean, I think about something not all that long ago, like when I remember when The Matrix first came out and go to see something like that. And it's like, wow, I've never seen anything like this before. And it's not a sequel. And it's, it's hard to envision that happening again right now. I think it will. But the costs are so exponential and the, and, and the, just the, the financial things associated with that makes it more and more difficult. Obviously, the industry, like most everything else, is going through some pretty weird growing pains, but it's also cyclical. Going to have a theatrical experience has survived harder things than this. So I feel like, you know, it's always going to exist in some form. Yeah, look, I think it will come back in some capacity, but I've, I think we're forever changed by the pandemic as well. I don't think there's going to be thousands of screens filled up with with people except for opening weekend on Spider-Man and there'll be some more Spider-Mans being made than French dispatch and tick, tick, boom. But I do think that, um, you know, having the access of a lot more movies through streaming is not a bad thing for me to be able to watch. You know, I would never be able to see the amount of content going out to a theater as I do, you know, just from home. And I think that's a good thing. We're inspiring there's so many young editors and filmmakers that have written me saying they saw Tick, Tick, Boom on Netflix and loved it and cried and they you know, it changed the way how you know how they thought about editing or you know filmmaking and that's no different than how I experienced you know falling in love with movies you know when I was young you know when I did the 3D concept movie I did the 3D concept movie explicitly because I thought I needed the skill set to be able to cut big 3D films. Like I literally said, I took a seminar, I think the guild offered some kind of seminar to cut 3D and I took that and then I cut the 3D concert movie and I was like, I want to cut music and I want to cut 3D and I want to be able to cut big 3D VFX shows. And after I did, I was like, do I want to do that? And then thank God it just kind of went away. But, um, you know, uh, who knows? That might come back too. You know, I thought virtual reality was going to be this huge thing that was going to explode, and then it kind of went away. And maybe it'll come back, and we'll be all living in the metaverse. But I, I do think that it, it is a bit cyclical. But I'm not sure it'll ever be the same. Where you know we're going out to see a majority of the things, you know, in the theater. I think it's probably going to be a hybrid. Myron, this last question falls to you because it was inspired by Andy, or at least something he talked about when we spoke last time. He was talking about having to uh, do a recut of a John Waters film. I believe it was a dirty shame and that it was not going to be able to be um, released without a, a, a blockbuster video version. It, Am I remembering this right, Andy? Yeah, but the issue was, um, it, I believe it was, someone could fact check me on this. I believe it was the first officially NC-17 film that Time Warner released. Mm, wow. And basically because of his positive long-term relationship with New Line and Hairspray, Good Graces and all that, he got them to agree to put his little movie out, um, even though it was against their policy. Um, but but the, 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 the compromise or the qualifying point was that in order to do that, they had to deliver a version of the film that was R-rated, that could get an R rating, that would appear on shelves at Blockbuster because that was part of their output deal. So I was tasked with figuring out how to make this movie, which the MPA said, no matter what you do, will always be NC-17. I had to figure out how to make it an R-rated film. And that 
meant I turned it into a film about foot fetishists instead of sex addicts using stock footage. <laughs> that, that, that was the line. That was it. And it became the neutered version. And I have a DVD of it on my shelf somewhere. I'm probably one of eight people in the world who still have that. But it was, you know, fill the shelf of Blockbuster. And that, would, that met their obligations. So congratulations, Myron. This question goes to you. <laughs> what, you oh, no. What is the strangest editing assignment you've ever had? Oh, God. Um, well, I would think that my strangest was also my first, which was cutting black and white with James Toback. Because not only was I cutting with James Toback, but I had... A parade of guests, everything from the Wu Tang Clan to Robert Town sitting there smoking a cigar in a closed edit room space while he watched the film and fall asleep, to all the other things that you would think that would happen with James Toback. And I knew if I could make it <laughs> this experience, that I might have a career to show for it. And that was basically a. Well, you were right. You had a career to show for it. Although I'm still going to give the award to weirdest gig to Andy. Yeah, uh, that's pretty good. Now that's going to be your core question. You got to ask everybody to see who tops me. Someone's going to top me. I guarantee it. But it's it's a it's a good collection of oddities you'll gather soon. <laughs> From now on, the Andy Weisblum question will end pretty much every interview. I think you should call it the Weisblum. I mean, honestly, where do you go from there? Indeed, Andy. Where do you go from there? Well, if you haven't seen Tick, Tick, Boom yet, I would say that's a pretty good place to go from there. Especially now that you've gotten to know Andy and Myron and heard about all they did to bring this project to the big screen or the small screen. Whatever size screen you want to watch it on, you should do that. Thanks to both those guys for all their hard work and for making some time for us so we could learn all about it. As I said at the beginning, today is Monday, January 24th, 2022, and it is hard to believe that the Sundance Film Festival is currently underway. In years past, when it was possible to get out there in person, it was a little easier to feel a part of it all and to meet a lot of upcoming and even established filmmakers. Hopefully next year that will be the case again. In the meantime, maybe we can do something Sundance-themed here on the show. We'll see. Until then, this is Matt Fury thanking you for joining me right here on The Rough Cut. Rough Cut.